This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. I just dig that piece of blues music. I can listen to that over and over and over. Um, Chris is uh, Mississippi's with us tonight, but he's on a mission. Uh, you know, we were we were just having a conversation, you know, before the show, and uh, I had mentioned the fact that I had forgotten to peel the can of Guinness open uh, from my wife's black and tan. Uh, a couple of days ago and just see what the hell a widget looks like. So uh, Chris is on a mission. Uh, he's got the Google running uh, and I can see the smoke from here. So uh, uh, Chris is going to tell us what a widget is here in a little bit. But hey, welcome to the Mead House. Tonight it is Tuesday night. Uh, we've got uh, some sizer talk uh, for you tonight. Chris, uh, Mississippi Chris in the house. He's got a recipe that he thinks you might be interested in. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, equipment investment versus convenience. Uh, how much do you spend and how much do you want to spend on your equipment? And is it, is it really worth it? And uh, uh, can you get by with, uh, you know, with some, some different things uh, that are a little bit cheaper? We'll catch up on a few projects, bragget sizers, that kind of thing. In the meantime... Uh, we are listed on TuneIn Radio, so if you're listening for the first time and you're mobile, you can join us there. Just do a search, The Mead House. Uh, the show also replays on TheMeadHouse.com, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Podcastpedia. So we are out there, folks. Uh, just look for us, The Mead House. We're on Facebook. Again, simply The Mead House, and uh, you know where we live. It's called TheMeadHouse.com. Call in number 818-921-4680. Feel free to call us anytime. Got a question, we'll be glad to help you out with it. Uh, In the house, Aaron Martin, Mississippi, Chris Spencer, Jeff Schaus, Ryan Richardson uh, joining us tonight. And, of course, my name is J.D. Webb. Did I leave anybody out? No? All present. All present and accounted for. Um, Mississippi, what would you find? Yeah. Okay. We all know that nitrogen, uh, the reason it gives it beer such a creamy head and carbonation, smooth carbonation is because it's able to form smaller bubbles than carbon dioxide. Okay. So, uh, this, the, the head on the beer can be enhanced with agitation, um, with more nitrogen. So when you get draft beer on tap that's nitrogenated, uh, additional nitrogen is added uh, at the spout, which creates a, a bigger and creamier head on the beer, like especially dark beers like Guinness. Mm. So the widget, what does it do? Well, um, oddly enough, uh, what I'm finding here is that most of the of the beers that are carbonated with nitrogen uh, commercial beers are done so with uh, dry ice or or liquid nitrogen. Uh, so they actually put liquid nitrogen into the can or bottle and then seal it. Uh, and then as the as it warms up, it it tends to create pressure and and carbonate the beer. Uh, oh. The widget is basically just a small uh, hollow device that has a very small hole in it, like a pinhole. And during the time in the can, this pressure pushes nitrogen and beer into the widget uh, and pressurizes it. So um, when you open the can or bottle, uh, it releases the pressure and it allows the pressurized nitrogen and beer that's inside the widget to jet out of the little hole. That causes an agitation of the beer and bubble formation so basically the the whole purpose of the widget is to increase the head on the beer (laughs) all that 
Yeah. Why can't Why so, can't you just shake the can up? Uh, I mean, that's what I do anyway. Uh, you can take two cans, shake them up, bang them together, and you know, say, "Give me a hell yeah." You know. <laughs> Well, things are starting to make more sense to me. The last couple of weeks, my wife and I have tried a couple nitrogenated beers, and she keeps telling me, you need to open it and let it sit for like 10 or 15 seconds before you pour it. And I kept not understanding why, and I guess that's why. So the widget can do its work, and that agitation can happen, and you get that nice, creamy head on there. Ryan, yeah. uh, Ryan, I think, is the only one amongst us who – does anything with nitrogen, Ryan? Chime in here. What's the uh, what's the deal? Yeah, you know, I uh, last week I was drinking a nitrogenated beer out of a can that did not have a widget in it, and and then you know I I really wasn't impressed with the carbon or the you know I guess I'll still call it carbonation that was coming out of it. It was not to me a true um, you know, the way you'd expect one to be. And, and, you know, then I had a Guinness later in the week, you know, which has the widget and, and it was just per, it poured perfect, you know, just the tiny, the tiny bubbles, the creaminess, the, it felt, you know, a good mouthfeel. Um, you know, I know that I've read that a lot of brewers are toying with how to, uh, you know, for how to put their nitrogen beers in cans. And I, you know, with that probably comes a lot of different testing and a lot of different ways to do it. Um, and this one, this one that I had last week while we were on the show that did not have a widget was, uh, I don't think is the way to go. I think, you know, for, for any, uh, commercial brewers out there toying with it, um, that, that widget, you know, is still um, the way to can anyway. Uh, going back to what you said about uh, about on tap, you know, I do have a a nitro keg set up. Now the keg is is the same keg that you'd use for anything else. Uh, you know, you use you just use a uh, you need a nitrogen regulator. Um, you know, obviously your your nitrogen tank, and then you do need a special tap a nitrogen tap that, uh, as Chris is saying, uh, puts that nitrogen on it right at, as you're pouring it out. So, uh, you know, again, I, my experience is all in, in the kegging. And, yes, you know, you definitely need a couple pieces of equipment. I mean, you if you wanted to save space or save some money, you know, it, the, it's the same keg, and then you just you switch out the regulator and the tap if you're going for a regular – regular carbonation or the nitrogen so the beer line and it's uh, there's actually two lines then going up to the single tap right you, so, I've, um, only, I've only got the one i mean i've got the the line oh. that goes in you know the the regulator and the, and the gas and then there's no gas hook up to the tap the tap is just a a nitro tap so I think some of those taps actually have some sort of mixer somewhere. There, there's got to be some place that that the gas is mixed or something to to agitate it. Something, yeah. I don't know. Can you? I, can, do you, uh, Ryan? Do you use the same tap handle and spout that you use with CO2? No, no. It is a different tap. It is a, yeah. a nitrogen tap. Uh, I didn't. I haven't done much research on it, but I was uh, told that you do need this special nitrogen tap to create that nitrogen um, head that you you know only get that you get with nitrogen, as opposed to your your regular beer tap. Uh, you know when it was car- regularly carbonated. I've seen I'll, those. I'll there's some sort of uh, like a some sort of baffle. Or agitator yeah. or something inside there that that probably agitates it. That's yeah. what I'm thinking too, because I, I've seen those at Keg Connection. Haven't really paid much attention to them, but I, I know that they're you know when you go into look at the 
different uh, taps. Uh, they actually call them faucets. Uh, there are uh, there's one particular one there for wine, and one particular one for uh, for doing these uh, stouts. Uh, uh, you know, like Guinness for nitrogen. So I don't know what they do. You know, I haven't really looked into them that much, but. Um, well, uh, so much on the nitrogen, uh, that might be something that uh, old J.D. here might uh, do a little bit more research on as well. And, uh, gosh, I just might have to buy a bigger refrigerator now. Damn it. <laughs> okay, J.D., before we move on, I've, I've got a question for yeah. you guys. Um, and this, this is going to show my total lack of knowledge for anything beer-related. Uh, in the in the realm of dark beers such as Guinness and stouts and porters and things, what what kind of beer would be like a Guinness, but it would have uh, some more residual sweetness? Same same basic beer, but just with more sweetness. What would I look for? I, Stout. Porter. You know, I'll jump in there for a second. Um, you know, within the stout family, there are uh, several different types. There's dry stouts, and there's sweet stouts, and there's milk stouts. And Chris, knowing that you like something a little more on the um, on the sweeter side, you know, I I'm trying to think of a commercial variety. But I mean, if you're at your your local liquor store. You know, you might want to look for those cans that cans or bottles or, or I guess just ask the, the clerk um, that you're looking for a sweet stout or a milk stout. Okay, because I like Guinness. Uh, I mean, I like the basic flavor of Guinness. I just wish it had a little bit more residual sweetness. Not, you know, nothing over the top, but just a little bit to balance the bitterness. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, Left Hand makes a really nice milk stout. Uh, you can get that, that on Nitro, too, and uh, uh, that's got a good residual sweetness to it. Another one um, is actually it's the same company that owns Guinness uh, puts out a, a, a brew called Kilkenny um, that's a little bit sweeter. I think it's also a little bit lighter. It's been a while, a while since I've had one, um, but that's another one that uh, is, is in the sweeter realm. Shoot me an email with those, so because I'll never remember them. That you got uh, that one that I was drinking last week, that uh, bourbon barrel, uh, <laughs> which uh, the name of it uh, just went south on me here. Uh, Ryan, if, what's say it again? That was Dragon's Milk. Dra- yeah, that's one. That's one. Uh, yeah, the Chris, New Holland. You, yeah, exactly. If you, uh, I mean, if you don't mind a slight taste of bourbon. Uh, that's a relatively sweet, uh, uh, almost a borderline for me, but uh, you might even enjoy that one too. So, okay. um, but, uh, well, again, welcome to the Mead house. Uh, what are we drinking tonight? I'll start this one off. I cracked a bottle open of, uh, my, one of my home wines. Uh, it's a bottle of Shiraz and I did something completely whacked out and, and got, well, not chastised for it on the wine form, but uh, I was told uh, that you just don't do that to Shiraz. I actually put some oak on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> apparently, you're not supposed to oak a Shiraz, but you know what? I don't care. I like it. It put a nice mouthfeel in it. I can't believe this. It's it's only like, uh, I think we just bottled it, uh, gosh, what's it been now, two and a half months ago? And it tastes damn good. Uh, you know, it's not hot. It's got a nice mouthfeel. It's got a nice finish to it. Uh, it was um, it fermented with uh, 14 ounces of fresh bl- uh, blueberries that were sautéed in a sweet uh, red muscadine wine. And, uh, I mean, it's perfect. I love it. So uh, if you like oaked Shiraz... <laughs> It's very fruit forward too. So, uh, but uh, apparently you're not supposed to oak Shiraz, uh, uh, Jeff. So uh, let's move on to you. <laughs> What's in your glass? 
Well, I got lazy this week. I didn't make a chance. It didn't get a chance to make it over to the liquor store. And, you know, I took a look before the show at uh, what I had in, in the cabinet. It was looking pretty bare. Um, so actually, I am drinking a glass of Irish mist, which is actually uh, Irish whiskey and a little bit of honey. Hmm. Um, so I'm hitting I'm hitting the hard stuff tonight. And it's I'll buy good that. <laughs> what kind of honey? Nice I don't know. Uh, it, it's the bottle comes with the the Irish whiskey and the honey. Pre-mixed, oh, okay. So. I thought that was something yeah. you were mixing yourself. I thought you were doing a little nope. shot of Jameson and a drop of orange blossom. <laughs> nope, but that sounds like it's on the right uh, on the right ticket. You know, it's got the sweetness of the honey, and it's got that the just a little bit of bite of that smooth Irish whiskey. So it's go. nice. Yeah, sounds good. Ryan, uh, what's in your cup? I am. Uh, I'm drinking another beer that my good buddy Christian shipped me. Uh, it is a gin barrel aged ale. Uh, gin it's, barrel. Yeah, it's a wow. it's it's a Kolsch, which is my favorite um, summer beer. I call that a lawn a lawnmower beer, aged in gin barrels with juniper berries and ginger added. Wow, it is very refreshing and light. And uh, I'm not a huge gin drinker uh, anymore. Um, but this is an amazing, an amazing beer. Wow. Sounds good. Yeah. I'm, I'm not much of a Kolsch fan, but the, the gin addition to that sounds interesting. I, I would still try that. I think. Yeah. I just know I've never heard of, uh, well, I'm not a gin drinker either. So, uh, I, I don't particularly care for anything gin related, but, uh, I would give that a shot. Uh, Aaron Martin, what are you drinking tonight? Just a, a quick comment on the gin. I I heard you say, Ryan, you're not a big gin drinker anymore, and it just made me laugh thinking back to the old college days. There was a bar that my my friend and I used to go to, and we would always order the same drinks. And it got to the point where the bartender, we would just walk up, and he'd make, uh, I think one was a kamikaze, which is like a lime some kind of a mixed drink. And then I would always order a gin and tonic and he would just get to the point where he'd just start making it. Wouldn't even ask us what we were having. So um, that sounds like a, a fascinating beer. I'll, I'll see if I can get my hands on some of that. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so uh, tonight I'm, I'm drinking, it's a honey wine, a mead. Um, although on the bottle here, it doesn't actually use the word mead. It's from Oliver winery and it's a black cherry honey wine uh, and it's it's okay i uh, this is my second bottle of of oliver mead that i've tried before the first one was just a, a traditional and um i don't i don't know that these are my favorite meads this one it, it's a little on the sweeter side um i definitely am getting that black cherry flavor coming through but it's just maybe a little a little flat and maybe a little too much on the sweet side um, could use a little bit more sharpness in there, but all in all, not terrible. And uh, Mississippi is it an Italian roast tonight? No, I'm breaking the rules tonight because I had a long day. There you go. <laughs> um, what you got? I've got a one-off batch that I made about a year and a half ago. Uh, it was partially planned, and it was partially sort of a clean out the cabinet type thing. Um, and it's it's unique. I don't know if I would suggest it to everyone or not, but I call it aftershave. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what it is, it's actually a bay rum acerglin. Um, bay- oh wow. Hmm. It's a it's a bay rum acerglin. It's uh, it's made with grade B dark maple syrup, uh, a little bit of sorghum molasses, some honey, and some uh, bay leaves. Oh wow! And it's it's uh, and I think I may have put some brown sugar in this as well. Uh, it was like I said, it was sort of uh, partially planned, partially not, and uh, it's it's unique. <laughs> it's it's not bad. But it's it's not my favorite. But I've got uh, one, two, three, four small beer bottles left, and I figured I would have one tonight. What? Uh, let's go back to the molasses here for a minute. Uh, do you remember what kind of molasses you you used? 
It's a black strap or well, some, yeah, probably just something from around here locally, just uh black strap molasses. But I don't mm-hmm. think I had very much molasses in it because I've never had good luck with uh putting molasses in, in anything fermented. So uh, it was probably yeah. like a, a little bit left in the bottom of the jar and I just threw I it, in. it in. Well yeah, I, I, uh, I, I recall the reason why I asked is because I recall uh some discussions uh over on the other show with uh, uh, you know regarding molasses and molasses is you know you got you if you're going to use it you got to be very very careful because it can really whack out the sulfur taste and uh sulfur aroma uh mm-hmm. did you uh yeah it's uh, it can be it can be pretty vile tasting when it's fermented if it's not done correctly and yeah. I haven't figured out the correct way to do it. Uh I've tried uh, I've tried a couple of sizers actually with some molasses in them and they were awful. Um so um I can't remember. I'm not looking at my notes right now and I don't even know if I made notes on this one. I just remember off the top of my head that I put some molasses in it, but I don't think I put much. Um we were, uh, I don't know what, I got. I sort of got on a bay rum kick for a while. My wife was making some homemade uh, soaps and lotions and aftershave and things like that, and she made some bay rum, and I really liked it. And uh, so I kind of got on this bay rum kick, and, and, I, I, and every time I smelled it, I could taste it. And I just it just seemed like something that would taste good. So I said, well, let's make a mead out of it. <laughs> and <laughs> so I probably just put the molasses in just because I know that rum is made from molasses and yeah. uh but I think the majority of it actually is the dark uh dark uh, grade B maple syrup. Yeah. And uh well good. Uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff uh have you uh, uh heard anything regarding molasses in your travels making mead? You know, I, I've not. I recall hearing bits and snippets, but I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what it was about. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've heard people adding some molasses or some uh, some maple syrup or some sorghum uh, syrup and things like that, and I um, couldn't tell you exactly what uh, what that adds to it. Did the maple, uh, can you get it, does it have a maple flavor to it at all, Chris? Because I've heard the... Oh. Uh, uh, you know, maple syrup is usually the first thing that ferments all the way out, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, during fermentation. Yeah, it, it's got a definite maple flavor to it, uh, cool. but it's probably because it's a year and a half old. Yeah. Um, the, there's no honey. I can't pick up any honey at all. Uh, yeah. That's why I think I probably made up most of the gravity with, with the maple syrup, probably. Yeah. Um, uh, a couple of bay leaves, and uh, I think I may have put one clove in it, or one or two cloves. Uh, it smells just like bay rum <laughs> aftershave. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It really does smell like like the aftershave, but it's uh, uh. Uh, it's it's pretty good. It's uh, on one to ten, I would probably put it about a. Eh, it's maybe a five. Yeah, drinkable. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing good deal. Well, uh, James Purcell over at the Mead Facebook group, uh, I found this uh, little uh, uh, post that he put over there, and I guess he's uh, he's kind of new at mead making, and he asked, well, I'll, I'll read it to you. He says, uh, so to ensure my mead, I should I add more honey? Uh, or sugar during fermentation, also to change to a sizer. How much sugar or honey do you add at bottling? Everything I've read just says to add sugar or honey. Says sorry, he's a newbie uh, and wants to try his best to do a good job. And the first thing I, I read that twice, and the first thing that came to my mind was. And and this is where it pays to know about the yeast. I mean, if you 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 plan it out and select your yeast, you got to know what you're going to do. 
uh, I think, uh, you know, that's that's the first thing, because uh, the first sentence, uh, Jeff, he says, uh, so to ensure my meat doesn't come out dry, should I add more honey or sugar during fermentation? So I, I would think knowing the limitations of your yeast would pretty much tell you, uh, you know, whether you're not you're going to have, you know, residual sugars left over or not, depending upon how you had your recipe set up, no? Absolutely. You uh, you need to know your alcohol tolerance of your yeast. And, you know, it's there are any number of calculators out there that can tell you based on alcohol tolerance and your your starting gravity, your final gravity, um, what uh, at what point the gravity is going to um, is, is going to like stop on you. Um, now, and- now, with that, you know, th- we've all heard stories and, and experienced how you can shoot a yeast way past its published. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. it, you know, alcohol tolerance um, or. You know, you might just have some yeast that goes the other way, and and no matter what you do, it's it's going to die out at a certain level. I'm personally not a fan of back sweetening. I know he didn't ask this, but what I like to do is is I um I keep one gallon jugs around of uh, mead that is of different sweetnesses, some that are some that are dry, some that are more sweet, um, that have, that have ended that way. You know, they've either ended dry or they've just ended fermentation with residual sugar. And then if I need something that I need to, you know, dry something out or I need to sweeten something up, I blend in, uh, one of those either drier or sweeter, uh, meads that I have uh, yep. sitting around now. Of course, those are stabilized, or else you'd you'd um, you know you could re reignite fermentation. But that's how I personally like to handle. Now, I agree with Jeff that you should do your your calculations up front. I just say that you know sometimes you you can't count on those because yeast is can be a funny creature and and go long or stop short. You, you are absolutely correct, Ryan, and that is a great best practice to use. Uh, you know, he's he's a first time mead maker, so I wasn't gonna, I, I don't want to overcomplicate him more than saying, hey, you know, find a tool online, figure Oops. out the alcohol tolerance. You know, I'm, I, I wish I could tell you I had the uh, the stock of mead to say, yeah, no, I can sweeten or dry, you know, adjust and blend. I I don't, my stuff gets drank too fast for that. <laughs> And, and, you know, in reality, there's very little insurance for your first batch anyway. Uh, yeah, <laughs> true. You know, that's just the, that's just the truth. The, this is one of those, uh, uh, you know, you got to pay your dues kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're going to you're going to mess up a few batches before you figure it out. So uh, I'll tell the guy this. And, I was, sorry, Chris, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that's where keeping notes comes in. Uh, mm-hmm. you, you make a batch, you keep track of exactly what you put in and then you taste it. And if it's too dry, you know, you need more next time. Yeah. And after, after a few batches, you get it figured out. Yeah. The, the, um, the one thing I was going to add is, you know, it's kind of a, it's pertinent, uh, for today's conversation or this question. I was having lunch with a, colleague who said that her husband uh, got into winemaking and quit. He made two batches and they, they weren't very good and he quit. And he, and he started with the cheapest wine kits he could find because he said that, you know, he goes, I'm, I'm just starting out. You know, I really don't want to use, um, you know, use good ingredients when I'm, when I'm learning or, or, a lot of money, I should say. He didn't say cheap ingredients. He said, I don't want to spend a lot of money when I'm just starting out. I get that. However, you know, quality in, quality out, crap in, crap out. Yep. So right. sort of to James here, you know, yeah, you're right. You know, it's, it's your first time. It's it's going to be, you know, a learning experience. The, the biggest key is sanitation because if it's clean, you know, you can you can age out most of your flaws. Um, 
but if you if you're starting with with uh crap for ingredients you know the mellow honey you know or something like that i mean at least give your ch- yourself a shot at a good at at a at a good product by having some some decent stuff that you're you're playing with yeah well and the second part of his uh, uh oh, go ahead go i was ahead, just going to add one more one more thing uh Y'all brought up the the issue of yeast overshooting their tolerance or stopping too soon or whatever. And uh, everybody that listens on a regular basis, they're going to say, well, here he goes again. Uh, but I'm here I go again. Uh, <laughs> temperature, temperature control has a lot to do with that. Uh, <laughs> it's certainly not everything, but temperature control has a lot to do with it. Uh, if you... Uh, if you're having trouble with your yeast constantly overshooting, uh, get that temperature down on the low end of your yeast tolerance range, and keep it there. And, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna cut that piece out where he says uh, low temperature <laughs> and, and make a little sound bite out of it. I can just, all I gotta do is just hit the button and it'll just play and play and play until I stop it. <laughs> Yeah, just uh, I'm I'm going to yeah. go I'm going to go have temperature control tattooed across my back. <laughs> uh, well, that's uh, you know, I mean that's the root to a lot of evils in meat in mead making, wine making uh, as well, temperature control. So, uh, it's but amazing. Uh, it's amazing. The other um, the other part of his uh, his statement here, he, he says he says to change it to a sizer, and I'm not quite sure. And now he may not understand the styles of mead and what they're all about, because I don't know what he means by change it to a sizer. That would depend on if he started out with apple juice or not, and that we don't know. Uh, you know, so uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, a sizer, the base is apple juice. Yep, am I correct? Yeah. I mean that's kind of where you got to start. And then from it, there you can use, you know, other additions, other juices, you know, different kinds of honey uh and what. So Yeah, as I read it, it's almost, you know, he's using the word sizer, but he he almost means carbonating, you know, cuz how much do I add at bottling, you know? Yeah, so, exactly. You know. Well, uh, and that's the third. That's that's the third part, Ryan, because uh, that's another area that you've got to be pretty darn careful. Because if you toss a bunch of sugar or honey in it during, you know, before you bottle, uh, and then start stuffing that stuff in bottles, cork or no cork, I mean, uh, even bottle caps can only stand so much pressure. You know, Northern Brewer has a great. Uh, bottle carbonating calculator uh, and that's uh, you know a plug for our friends there but if you go to the it's a, it's a free calculator it's on their website you plug in your your starting gravity finishing gravity the level of carbonation that you want and what you want to use to to um, to bottle condition with you know and it's got all it's a great tool to play with I play with it and uh, it, it hopefully, um, you know, you can take the a lot of the risk out of bottle bombs. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. It's a great resource. Well, uh, James, I hope we helped you out here just a little bit. And uh, I might head you on over to the meathouse.com. There's a recipe over there. Uh, it's an orange blossom uh, recipe. It's very simple. It's a good beginner's recipe. It's solid. It works. Uh, go ahead and give that a uh, a try, and uh, see what you come up with there. We'd be good, we'd be glad to hear from you. Uh, uh, you know how you did on it too. So, uh, but I hope uh, I hope that helped out a little bit. Um, talking about, uh, I just wanted to throw this out there. Uh, I didn't really want to talk a whole lot about it, but you see where AB InBev has acquired Midwest Supplies and Northern Brewer. I did see that a lot of uh, uh, there's been a lot of passionate comments around that on on some of the forums. 
Well, some of these guys, um, you know, yeah, and passionate. I mean, they're very passionate about what they're doing in the craft beer industry. And I've got some passion about it. I mean, I don't drink AB InBev products or Sab Miller Coors anymore, but I'm strictly a craft beer uh, drinker. But uh, I just thought I'd throw that out there, uh, you know, uh you know, what are we to expect? Who knows? So, you know, and I believe me, I'm not an apologist for those those mega brewers, but I think sometimes a little bit of context can help. And, you know, the Northern Brewer has been owned, partly owned by a investment bank, investment group for a while. And and it was a the another investment group which just happens to be owned by, you know, the, the Miller Coors or, or InBev that, or, uh, that bought it. Um, I mean, these guys are, they're in the business of finding investments. They're in the business of, yeah. you know, uh, operating companies that make money. I mean, I think that a lot of the passion comes around, um, what is this going to change the the is, is it going to change my store is it going to change the the company um i'll tell you this in my experience working with hedge funds and working with uh private equity groups um they they buy companies that can make money or that are making money and they try to enhance them if anything you know it's not the uh you know, think, Michael uh, Douglas from Wall Street trying to do yeah. the, the Telstar paper, Blue Star Airlines deal. Yeah. I think the fear is out there that the next beer kit that you order is going to have a Budweiser emblem on it or something. I don't know. Um, anyway, I, I, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on that. Uh, just a piece of news that I picked up on. I gave my two cents. I mean, I'm not in the habit of giving AB InBev any more than what I absolutely have to. So, I'll probably spread my purchases around a little bit. But, um, you know, last week we talked about this apple juice concentrate thing. We kind of got on that. Uh, and uh, I think it was Chris uh, had mentioned that, uh, you know, these cider kits that you can buy from Northern Brewer in various places, um, they're some form of concentrated apple juice. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, you, you get them and, uh, uh, the one kit that, uh, he was referring to is, I think it was a one gallon kit, if I'm not mistaken, uh, of this concentrated juice. And, it, you know, you, you put it in your fermenter, throw the yeast in and, uh, let it bubble away. Well, I went to the store, uh, we did our, our weekly shopping and I thought, well, I'm going to try this. So. I brought home the equivalent to about a gallon of apple juice concentrate, frozen apple juice concentrate. And uh, I dumped it all into my one gallon or my two gallon uh, food container and uh, put the lid on and let it sit out overnight to thaw out. Well, the next day, I uh, thought, oh, to find out what the gravity of this is. So I plopped the, uh, the uh, hydrometer in and it almost bounced out of the bucket. Okay, I mean it wouldn't even register. I mean it just it kept bobbing up and down and tilting back and forth because it, there wasn't even enough hydrometer in the liquid to even get its own balance. <laughs> okay, so I'm guessing somewhere in the one one nineties to two hundred level, maybe. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny, um, and so I immediately uh, texted Chris and I said, "Hey." This apple juice concentrate, you're not going to believe what it reads on a hydrometer. So, uh, yeah. so, yeah, he so sent with me a picture of the hydrometer bobbing <laughs> in the bucket, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, bulb on the end was like halfway out of the concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. So you can't use, uh, do not use, uh, pure apple juice concentrate. Uh, you know, if you're going to do it, what I wound up doing was I, I poured, uh, two gallons in to make it a three gallon batch. I think I wound up, uh, well, actually I added one pound, uh, actually a little bit more than a pound of brown sugar, uh, rather than honey. 
uh, and uh, talking with Chris, uh, we decided that maybe that was a route I should go with this thing, just make it a straight cider. And uh, we brought the gravity up to uh, 1.092, and uh, because I wanted this thing to go dry, I'm going to use uh, the uh, SO5 uh, yeast in it. But uh, and in fact, and I, it's I already, still think that's a little bit high. To be honest, I, I think actually, that's. Yeah, and I, I take that back. Not not the SO5. I use Nottingham. I use Nottingham in it. Um, okay. Yeah. So I'm. I well, not, that's, Nottingham. That's still a high gravity. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping it's going to. Well, I, I'm, I'm. I'm thinking it's probably going to take it into my realm of, of, uh, uh, you know, of likeness. I think it's going to come out, you know, somewhat on the dry side. Not, you know, it's not going to be candy sweet like a candy apple for sure. But, uh, you know, so or based Martin on Allen. your results, and based on your results with the hydrometer, I'm going to make a guess that this apple juice concentrate that's in the cider kit is not fully concentrated. It's probably been diluted down to the proper uh, concentration. Yeah. So, I mean, it may not be all the way to apple juice, but it's it's uh, certainly been diluted to the proper gravity that they wanted. So that, yeah. that would be my guess. It's just not full concentrate. Well, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know if there are different kinds of concentrate out there or not. But this may not even be the same kind of concentrate. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not. I don't even know how they even. How they, I mean, I know the heat is involved somehow. Uh, but uh, you know, how much heat? Uh, I have no idea. I don't have any clue. Jeff, you were going to say something. Uh, I was actually going to say, you know, if you if you take that all the way to dryness, you're ending up with something pretty heavy as far as alcohol content. You're in the neighborhood of eight to nine percent, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, I don't have a calculator in front of me, but um, yeah, that's fine, and and that's yeah. fine. It's more no, it's <laughs> more than that, Jeff. Ten ninety twos is on upwards of twelve percent. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Like I, I said, have, I didn't I have think... a calculator in front of me. <laughs> I know uh, it, I did. It's uh, between ten and twelve, I think. I think it is right about ten because I, I I did uh, a one a few weeks ago at uh, ten ninety. It was a target uh, alcohol percentage of ten percent. So I, I think you're right. Yeah. On the 90, yeah, I think I recall seeing ten ten on the uh, ABV side of the hydrometer when uh, uh, at that point. So, but and and that's fine. Uh, and okay most of the that. people making those are are calling them turbo ciders. So it's not unheard of. It's just, yeah. uh, God, it's going to be, you know, you're not yeah. going to drink three or four. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, you know, uh, end, res end result, I'll probably, uh, you know, maybe chuck some oak in it and uh, might even soak some oak in some bourbon and uh, chuck those in and... Uh, uh, and see what happens. So, but I just thought it was, you know, uh, I felt the need, uh, you know, since we talked about it last week to pursue this. And uh, lo and behold, uh, you know, apple juice concentrate. I mean, don't even bother. Uh, it's uh, not even going to register on your hydrometer. So uh, there you go. <laughs> you know, JD, uh, you know, I'm making a, a bourbon cider or bourbon uh oak cider as well um i've been thinking uh you know of the about adding a vanilla bean to that having having a vanilla bourbon sure. oak cider um yeah you know, maybe maybe one of us should try it and you know let the other one know how it turns out yeah i've got uh i've got a ton of vanilla beans here uh i can chuck one in and uh uh, you know, and see what it does. I mean, I think, you know, if you're going to oak it, I think vanilla, not a lot of vanilla, mind you, uh, I would probably, this is a three gallon batch. So one bean, uh, is probably more than enough. In fact, I might even cut the bean in half and, uh, start with one. Uh, you can always add more vanilla later, but I think it will start with, with a half of one. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, depending on, you know, what kind of oak and what the toast level on the oak uh, is, uh, you know, on top of that. So, 
but uh, certainly oak and vanilla go together very well. So, um, one thing um, I, I thought uh, you know, Chris Chris sent a recipe uh, uh, in for the uh, for a blueberry sizer. Uh, we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit, but I, I kind of wanted to get into this. Um, uh, a small discussion on the on placing a value on the con, on the convenience of your equipment, uh, and uh, because I you know Jeff or, or no I think it was Ryan had sent an email and and said that he was looking at a uh, uh, what was it called a catalyst uh, yeah the, the catalyst by Northern Brewer yeah and. Uh, I you know I remember looking at something similar. I think they call it a fast ferment, and it's a kind of a bulbous looking thing, like an upside down teardrop. Yep. Uh, and at the bottom is this little contraption that you uh, can screw on that actually catches all of the spent yeast and trub and everything that settles out into this other little bulb thing, and you can pull it out and. Really, you don't even have to rack anything. I mean, you're 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 basically left with fermenting and racking all in the same container, uh, and going through your clearing. So you, you know, you, no racking whatsoever. So I was just wondering, uh, amongst the four of us here, uh, five of us, you know, what, uh, uh, how much is some of this equipment worth to our convenience? I mean. Uh, and, you know, is this a hobby that we're that we're all willing to invest in uh, at different levels? Uh, I know some. You know, I guess I kind of put it in the email. The difference between a paper airplane and one of these newfangled high tech radio controlled airplanes. Uh, <laughs> so, you know. yeah, just real quick, I'll tell you. Since, since I I have the fast ferment and I use that, you know, the whole pitch of it is that. It is an all-in-one system. I mean, you put your ingredients in it, you know, you, you do your primary, you shut off the valve, or you close the valve, you take that bottom container off, you know, you can clean it out, put it back, or you can harvest the yeast from it, put it back, reopen it, you know, now you're in your secondary fermentation, close it again, uh, replace it instead of putting the valve there you replace it with a hose you know, your bottling hose and you can bottle directly from it so i mean it's it's an all-in-one uh fermentation device you know all the way from you know primary to bottle uh you know i i said i've had i've had some issues with mine i haven't been all i i love the idea i think that because it's made out of plastic it's it's had some issues, um, and I while I have seen uh, the the stainless steel conical fermenters, oh I sh- you know they also say that the the conical um, shape of it, uh, it it shortens the primary fermentation time. This it's supposed to create some kind of vortex that that uh, ferments a little quicker. You know the well fast ferment. You know right. Yeah. Um, the, I have not seen a, you know, even my neighbor has got a, has got a conical, uh, stainless steel one, but, but the difference is, I mean, the, he can't bottle from his, I don't know if you can bottle from yours, JD, but, but it's that it, it, it is really, it replaces your primary, your secondary and your bottling bucket, you know, so that you're, you, you save yourself from all the rackings, all the cleanings, and any risk of exposure to oxidation, again, if it were working correctly. Yeah. No, I can't bottle from mine, although it does have a cone shape. I don't know that I would call it a conical. It's got. A, it's not a full conical like you see uh, with some of the Blickman and uh, even some of the uh, Brutex stuff out there, but it does, it does have a valve on it uh, that you can use to uh, rack with, uh, and you just simply turn the valve so that the little uh, stainless steel tube on the inside is now facing upright instead of down during fermentation. You turn it till it faces upright, 
and then uh, it will, uh, you know, you can outflow the the uh, the fermenter without picking up the the trub and spent yeast and leaves at the bottom. So uh, that's, I guess, an advantage. Um, but you know, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about you know, if you're going to get involved in this hobby, I mean, at what? How far do you want to go? Because I know that you can get plum buried in this. I mean, I've probably got, oh, maybe close to maybe fifteen hundred bucks, uh, if that. You know, maybe, maybe sixteen hundred bucks invested in my setup. Mm-hmm. Um, Chris, uh, I, I know, I know you, uh, mm-hmm. and I know I that feel- you're the cheapest guy on the planet. <laughs> I still have my lunch money from the second grade. <laughs> so, uh, what uh, you know? What what what's, what is your equipment worth to you? And do you is there any investment opportunities for you? I mean, is 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 this a hobby that you want to invest further in, or are you satisfied where you're at? I am perfectly satisfied where I'm at because it's no secret I'm a miser, and. Uh, I'm I'm using food grade plastic buckets that you can get from Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, pl- food grade plastic trash cans if it's a big batch. Uh, and I'm making mead that I like, that my family and friends like. And quite frankly, I, I believe uh, some of them could win awards. I have no reason to step up to anything else. I have no reason to look for other methods. They're readily available. They're cheap. They're easy to clean. Um, and I would probably, if I had to look at my entire mead making setup, all the equipment and everything together, uh, carboys and all, probably 200 bucks at yeah. the most. So... And I'm making good mead, so uh, I, I just, you know, I, I just don't have any uh, motive to uh, to step up to anything else. I'm perfectly happy with it. Yeah. So the paper airplane works for you. Works for me good, and sails far. Yeah. Aaron, uh, what's your uh, what's your take on all this? I mean, is this uh, is this something that you're willing to invest in, spend the money? Uh, or are you like Chris? Are you satisfied with the, with what you got, or do you have a desire to see it to you know see it to another level? It's a good question. I, I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I will say the the setup that I have now, I'm perfectly satisfied with. But I'm also in a climate and an environment where I can can kind of get away with it. So my setup is is pretty simple. I ferment both primary and secondary in glass carboys. I don't have a kegging system. I, I bottle everything. Um, and and like I was alluding to earlier, I, I live in a climate where down in the basement, especially in the winter months, you know, it's 63, 64 degrees down there, which is right in, in the zone of where I want to be fermenting. Um, with all that being said, I, I do think that I am definitely interested in in um, kind of enhancing my setup and and uh, looking at at some new different things I can add on. Probably a a more sophisticated temperature control setup is something that that would probably be first on my list. I, I think for me, it's it's more about prioritizing. You know, looking at things like kegging systems, um, temperature control systems. Um, you know, different types of fermenters, whether that's stainless steel or the um, the catalyst, I think it was called, which which looks like a pretty neat setup as well. You know, these are all things that uh, kind of perk my interest in, and are all things that I would be interested in in pursuing at some point. It's just a matter of what's the, the highest priority and, and uh, when is the right time to, to make the move on that. But I, I think for right now, I'm probably in a good place with with the setup that I have. Yeah. And Jeff, these, uh, gosh, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the homebrewtalk.com. I love looking at the pictures of some of these. 
I guess they call them brew sculptures that these guys have. I mean, <laughs> yeah. these these mountainous looking contraptions with kettles and stainless steel and uh, all of that, and it's in that, it's in a guy's garage. You know, I mean, it looks like a ten thousand dollar. You know, for what? For a couple of cases of craft beer on a weekend? <laughs> you know? I look uh, at setups like that and go, man, I'm glad I'm a meat maker and don't boil much. <laughs> <laughs> What's your, uh, where are you at with uh, with all this? I know you've been working on a, uh, on a refrigerator for a fermenter, yeah. uh, you know, temperature control wise, but. You know, as far as far as upgrading or taking, you know, where is it that you want to be with your equipment? And are you willing to spend, uh, you know, the money to get there? Or are you like Chris, uh, perfectly satisfied with the Walmart product, the Lowe's product, the buckets here and there, trash cans? You know, I, I would say, if anything, I'm, I'm kind of in line with, with Aaron here. Uh, when it comes to investing in, in gear, I'm not opposed to, to spending a little money to get uh, get up there, but I'm looking for bang for buck. I want to make sure that you know what I'm doing is going to going to be a good uh, a benefit to me. So, like you know, the the fridge that I found for cheap that I'm slowly converting up to the temperature control. Um, that's a small investment, a lot of time, uh, and I'm I'm perfectly happy to do that because um, that will ultimately get me better mead and. Uh, uh, you know, for the the amount of my free time that I'm spending, you know, basically just tackling a puzzle in my mind, um, this is a perfectly acceptable trade off. Uh, yeah. When it when it comes to stuff like the fast ferment or the catalyst, um, I'm, I, I'm I'm reticent to be an early adopter. I, this is going to make me sound like I'm several decades older than I am, but you know, newfangled uh, fishy stuff. It, it, it looks like it, it could go either way. It could be really useful. It could be a, a new, innovative way to do things, or it could be a gimmick that's going to prove to be you know, kind of not worth my time. Uh, and it sounds like with, with the threading issue on those fast ferments, mm, yeah, they, they've got some kinks to work out. So, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I don't jump on to, uh, to new trends, but I want to get a couple generations in to let them figure out some of the the flaws of the first run before I jump in on that and um, spend my money there. Yeah. Can I add something to this? Uh, in addition yeah. to what I said earlier, um, I based my opinion on this, on the quality of mead that I'm producing. Um, and that's what I think everyone should do. So sure. if you're, if you have the capabilities to produce what you like, then you're where you need to be. Uh, if if you're lacking something, then that's where you need to be spending your money. So yeah, sort of like Aaron said, prioritizing your purchases. What what can you buy? If you're going to buy something, what can you purchase that's going to improve your quality? Uh, and if you're just wanting to buy some gadget uh, that's not necessarily going to improve your your mead making. Uh, that's fine too if that's what you want to do if you really enjoy the hobby that much uh, but you know I'm not opposed at all to spending money to improve the quality uh, but I'm at a point right now where I don't think I have any more knowledge um, as far as mead making goes I don't think that there's a gadget that's going to help me make better mead Um I think yeah. the only thing that's going to help me make better mead is just simply more experience. And if sometime in the future that I come across uh, something that I do think will help, I'm certainly not opposed to getting it. Yeah, I, Chris, um, I, go ahead, Aaron. Just, just going to say, I think um, you, you raise a good point and, and it's helping me kind of expand some of the thoughts that, I'm having on the subject, it's, you know, quality is, is definitely one thing. And, and just one other factor that I think plays into it as well is just your own efficiency as well. You know, earlier Ryan was talking about that um, catalyst as being a, a fermenter that is both the primary, it's the secondary, and it's also your bottling bucket. So, you know, you think of all of the time that you spend cleaning and sanitizing different fermentation vessels and racking and, and transferring the mead from vessel to vessel, 
you know, with, with that setup, now you're cutting all of that time out as well. So, so efficiency may be another factor in addition to the quality when, when going to prioritize. Now, I think I'm in line with you that if I was prioritizing my purchases, I'd probably start with the things that are going to help me make better mead and improve the quality of my mead before I move to something that's going to help me do it faster. Um, just because it, you know, for me, it, it's a hobby. The time that, that I spend making meat or, you know, racking and things like that, it's, it's enjoyable time for me. It's, it's a way I like to spend my free time. So, you know, speeding that up isn't, isn't something that's real high on my priority list. Exactly. Just like an automatic stir, you know, uh, the time that I spend making meat and tending to it is is sort of downtime for me. It's relaxing. Uh, I enjoy starting a batch of meat and going in there every day, checking the gravity, stirring it, degassing it, putting in the nutrients. Uh, you know, I could buy a fermenter with an automatic stir where it's stirred constantly, and uh, all I would have to do is basically dump it in and push a button and forget about it. Uh, but that takes all the enjoyment away from it. I'm I'm sort of a hands-on person. I enjoy uh, I enjoy doing things. So I'm not really looking to to shortcut and save time. But I will definitely spend money on something that will improve the quality of it. Well, that makes perfect sense. I mean, that's you know, I uh, uh, you know my, my my take on this whole thing is I jumped into this thing with uh, with pretty much with both feet, and after uh, after the first couple of failed, well, I wouldn't even call the first one a, a, a real failure. I mean, it's over two years old and it's starting to come around finally. But I learned a lot of lessons early, and that's when I went in search of equipment. What I really, you know, what do I need to do to really accomplish what I need to accomplish? And I wasn't, in, you know, I could care less about competitions. Uh, or any of that. I just wanted to, like Chris, make you know good mead, and uh, so I looked at different recommendations, and I, I chose to go the stainless steel route and uh, bought one. Uh, really liked it. Uh, bought a second one. Uh, they gave me a little more versatility. Uh, I could have gone, you know, I and I, I, I there are reasonable amount that I'm willing to invest. But there's not an overly whacked out amount that I'm gonna spend uh, because I could have I could have gone out and bought one of these glycol systems, uh, but that's five grand, you yeah. know. So but I you're obsessed with stainless steel, JD. Well, uh, because it's clean. Uh, it's it's a it's a vessel that has a an internal chilling system. Nothing else. Uh, plastic. Uh, has anything? If they, uh, if they ever, if they ever start making those love dolls out of stainless steel, you're going to end up divorced. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> everything you've been buying is stainless steel. Stainless steel. Well, because you know, I, I, it's clean. I like it, and uh, almost, almost got into a third fermenter. Uh, you know, to use strictly for beer, and of course that was the tough one to have to try to run by the wife. And she says, "Well, just how much beer do you think we can drink?" <laughs> so, uh, so I got to figure out another angle. But uh, uh, I don't know that I even really need it. Uh, you know, to be honest with you, I mean, it's one of those things that uh, you would, you know, you hope for uh, that would appear underneath a Christmas tree at Christmas time, but. Um, and JD not, said the famous last words of a redneck is watch this watch this <laughs> but you know I mean I, I've got a nice system it works uh, yeah I invested uh, you know a few bucks into it um, and it works for me so I think uh, Chris I mean Chris, Chris really said a mouthful there I mean you know, I, I think you're going to spend as much as you think you need to spend to make good mead, uh, and you really don't have to spend any more. Uh, and if you're happy with your equipment, go for it. Uh, but if you're the kind of person that uh, uh, you know thinks that uh, you know it would be easier and convenience uh, sometimes get get in the way. 
to go out and spend the money to uh, like I did. I mean, a lot of this is convenience uh, for me. I, uh, the way my my little brew wall is set up, I like it. It works, uh, mm-hmm. and I'm happy with it. So, yeah. but, uh, just just to, but big boy, here. big boy toys are fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just have big boy toys for other hobbies rather other than mead making. So yeah. uh if you're if you want your big boy toys for mead making, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. I would just throw out the caveat there that you know you when you're looking at investing in stuff, make sure that you're investing in stuff for your enjoyment, for the convenience of it. Don't yeah. don't let yourself fall into the trap that thinking, you know, if I buy this stainless steel fermenter, uh my meat is gonna be so much better for it. It might be a little bit better for it, but you know, don't don't let yourself fall into the trap of oh, I can just you know get better stuff by uh, getting better equipment. Make better mead first, and then well, let me yeah, let me. Uh, better. I'm sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. No, I, you, that was the end of my thought. You know, I was going to say now first. what this can do is it can it can help you along your journey. And I'll say two things on that. The one is um, if you, if oxidation is an issue, this, you know, when you're transferring, this can eliminate, you know, that or or help eliminate that exposure to oxygen. Now, number two is if, if you have trouble racking, if you're not used to how to do it, or if you're not an expert at it yet, and you or you don't have a a good racking cane and you tend to suck up some sediment um this can help you with with that as well so i mean it 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 can uh give give somebody the tools who may not have the best practices yet to eliminate oxidation and eliminate sediment now with that being said i think that for about a quarter of the price you could do your primary fermentation in a bottling bucket, run the tube into a uh, carboy, probably a plastic carboy that's also got a spigot on it, and you could you could go from you could primary ferment your bottling bucket, secondary ferment in your um, your car your plastic carboy with a spigot on it, and then just bottle it right out of there. Yeah. Well, you know, the other thing, too, is I, uh, you know, you go to Craigslist uh, out here where I'm at and type in beer equipment or beer making equipment, craft beer equipment, and you'd be surprised how many of those uh, brew sculptures, Jeff, that are up for sale, which kind of kind of makes you wonder what happened. <laughs> you know, well, you know, I. I uh, I tend to lurk on some local home brewing clubs near me that I've yeah, my 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 problem with home brewing clubs is not that uh um that I I don't like being a part of a group but you know I have a hard time making it to meetings and being consistent with a, a monthly schedule and you know, I I I've gone to a couple to check them out and I've just never stuck with one uh but I I've joined their Facebook groups and I see messages of from them and what I see happening a lot is people will will get a, like an elaborate gas setup, and they go, "Yeah, this is a lot of this is a lot of stuff. It takes up a lot of space in my garage. It's a big hassle on brew day, and I'm yeah. I'm taking it all day. I'm just going to downsize to an electric brew in the back system, and I'm just going to get rid of all this other gas stuff." <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so exactly. I, I think I think everyone finds their medium when it comes to the amount of space they want, uh, the amount of complication they want in their setup. And what they want to do with it. I mean, you could probably, you're, you're probably accomplishing more with a gas powered system and like multiple mash tons and kettle and all that than you are with a single kettle brew in the bag system. But uh, if you're getting what you want out of a simpler setup, um, there's nothing wrong with going simpler either. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, spend uh, spend whatever you want uh, to make you happy, I guess, uh, you know, as far as the, you know, your equipment. Hey, and don't forget the DIY stuff, too. I mean, we've, uh, you know, turned a couple of shows out uh, on uh, several projects, uh, uh, you know, and uh, if I could go down Chris's road, the whole temperature thing, uh, you know, we came up with an idea. Uh, Chris is using a, uh, uh, a pretty hefty uh, uh cooler system like i'm using and it works 
uh, and it works for me. And it's convenient plus it's efficient. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I made a big mistake a moment ago. I said all my equipment together was probably a what? couple hundred bucks. Uh, yeah, I forgot. I forgot about the cooling system. Yeah, uh, I think I tried to subconsciously put that purchase out of my mind. Yeah, let's uh, say let's say five hundred bucks, right? Uh, <laughs> more I, than that. I know what that cooler costs. <laughs> it, it was big time. Uh, it hurt. It hurt my feelings. Well, uh, yeah, but the nice thing is, uh, you know, I've got two fermenters running. Uh, I don't have anything else running off the cooling system. Just the two fermenters. And I'm putting my block ice that I make at home uh, into my cooler, and I do that once every six days. Okay? And the water temperature never goes above 45 degrees in the cooler. Never. So in six days, uh, I don't mind. In fact, I I make so damn much block ice now that I, I, I have to stop. Uh, I've got, uh, you know, my, my little freezer will only hold, uh, two of the containers plus, uh, plus three of the blocks, uh, after they come out of the containers. So then that's all I can stuff in there. So, uh, you know, so you talk convenience uh, versus expense, uh, before I was having to make ice every other day and it was a pain. Uh, but now that I've got, you know, I spent the money, uh, $300 cooler, six days, you know, and it runs, it runs two of the fermenters. So, uh, yeah, I've put, I've put two batches of mead through this cooling system so far, uh, because I've been so busy. I just haven't had time to make a lot of mead lately. And, uh, throughout the entire primary fermentation on both batches, I put one block of ice in the Yeti. Yeah. Uh, through the end, I mean, other than what I put in in the beginning, I had to put ice in once through in the entire primary. So, right. uh, I guess I'm getting my money's worth, but it was well, a lot of money. You know, it's uh, well, I, like I said, it goes back to the to the beginning of the conversation. You know, what I mean, what what's it worth to you, and how much do you want to spend on it, and how serious of a hobby is it really uh, for you? And uh, of course, that's all stuff that you need to figure out on your own. Uh, Moving on, uh, let's get an update on where we're at with our braggots and sizers. Uh, Mine uh, has uh, almost, I get a bubble about once every 10 minutes of that now. Uh, This is that bourbon barrel beer kit, remember. Um, We put six and a half pounds of wildflower honey on top of everything that was else that came in the kit. Uh, and we're just going to go see what, what happens. Uh, and, uh, but it's, uh, in the final stages of primary fermentation, uh, probably going to give it about maybe six or seven more days, maybe a week and a half, uh, before we, uh, see where we're at on the hydrometer and uh, take it into secondary. And uh, when I get it there, it'll go on some oak and some bourbon, uh, maybe even a vanilla bean or two uh, to see where, uh, you know, see what we come out with. So that's that's where my brag is at. Uh, uh, Chris, did your kit come in? Yep, I'm four days into primary right now. I did the... um um uh, degassing this morning and i'll probably do the final nutrient addition tonight after we get finished with the show and uh you know it's been uh it's been cool enough here i don't even have this batch in my cooling system um i just set it to the side and it's it's going going to town so i'm looking for the uh probably going to be just a tad bit past the one third sugar break tonight so it'll get the final nutrients and that'll be it yeah ryan uh, where you're at with yours uh mine's 10 days in primary uh it's it's gonna go to secondary uh this week sometime just just when i get the time i've i've actually got to um clean out i've got i'm all my carboys are are full I've got two five-gallon carboys that are about the same 
or that are the same wine. Um, and I'm going to move those into a, I've got a 10 gallon Demi John. So I got to, I got a little work ahead of me. I got to move those two, got to clean out the Demi John, move the two five gallon carboys into the 10 gallon Demi John, then clean out those five gallons so I can rack the, uh, the brag it into one of the five gallon carboys where it's going to sit on a vanilla bean and eight ounces of toasted coconut. And in case you're wondering why it's going to be eight ounces of toasted coconut, it's because that's how big the package was at Whole Foods. (laughs) Is eight ounces going to be enough, do you think? I think it is. I don't want, I'm not trying to make a coconut braggot. I'm trying to make a braggot that's got a little bit of coconut essence to it. So I do feel that 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 eight ounces is going to do it. Well, that's you know, coconut being as light as it is, it's still a lot of coconut. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, cool. Jeff, uh, what's up with the uh, braggot? Did we lose Jeff? I'm here. I'm here. Mine is uh, clear into secondary. Um, I am, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's been about six weeks now since I started it, and it has... Uh, it's cleared, um, looks, looks and tastes fantastic. I think when I, I submitted this recipe weeks and weeks ago, um, I, uh, I, I gave like a laundry list of stuff we could do with it once it got to secondary and I'm tasting it and I'm finding, you know, we really don't need to do much of anything at all with it. It has, uh, the, a lot of the, the yeast character that I was looking for. Um, it has the, uh, the, that kind of a, that prototypical spiciness you get from the saison. Uh, there's a little bit of that, I don't know, bitterness or acidity from the basswood honey that I used that came out really nicely and actually paired really well with this. Um, so at this point, I'm just going to get some bottles together, um, use a priming calculator to figure out how much more honey I want to add to this to get some, some carbonation on it and, yeah. uh, and get that bottled up. Wow. Sounds good. And uh, it's Aaron's fault that we're going down this whole braggot road to begin with. <laughs> uh, you know, if, had he not sent me that one bottle of, of braggot, uh, you know, uh, we probably would have been doing something else. But, <laughs> dude, that stuff was so good. Uh, what's up with the uh, braggot project in your house? So for me, the the black IPA style braggot, I've got the recipe down, um, just got some some things going on in life right now that are keeping me from starting any new batches, maybe for the next uh, couple of months here. Um, okay. But I, I think this is one of the things I've, I've kind of got a queue of things that when, when I'm able to get back into it, um, this is going to be near the top, if not at the top, is the uh, the black IPA braggot, but um, the recipe, I think, is is finalized, and and uh, I'll be ready to to hit this one hard. Yeah, cool. Um, the uh, I, I, actually, Jeff took a question from Scott Ma to that here uh, in just a little bit. But first, I, I wanted Chris to talk about this. Uh, man, I got to try this too. This, this sounds so good. This uh, uh, blueberry sizer. Uh, recipe, and I'm going to go ahead and throw it up on the website uh, later on tonight, too, but uh, Chris, uh, yeah, talk but to us about before this. You uh, put it, before you put it up, I've got a couple of uh, refinements I need to make there. Uh, okay. Um, and mostly in measurements and things. All right. Um, but uh, this, is, uh, this is entirely uh, credited to uh, Pete Bakalich. Uh, who, who really made a, a he, he was on a sizer kick and he may still be, I don't know, but I found this on, uh, on an internet search that, that Pete had, uh, had posted somewhere and he had originally posted it for a six gallon yield and uh, I decided to scale it down for a one gallon so that p- more people might be willing to try it. Um, and it uses a couple of, uh, unique techniques actually uh one is to to let it sit on the on the fruit skins and uh on the trub for uh about a month 
uh, six weeks, actually, I think. And then it also uses Lee's aging in secondary. And um, so that was two techniques that I don't think we've really talked that much about or covered. Right. Um, so uh, the benefit that you're going to get from letting this sit on the berries for a while is uh, is you're going to get more color extraction. You're going to get some of the fine grain tannin extraction from the berries that you might not get just in primary. And uh, then the leaves aging will add a lot of mouthfeel and body to it and, uh, and really change the character of the whole thing. Uh, so it, it gives you a, a, an exercise in doing some things that we haven't talked about much and, it, and also an exercise in patience. Um, because we're going to be doing Lee's aging, this is one of the few times you'll ever hear me say this, but do not, do not use 71B yeast on this. Um, DD, uh, excuse me, D47 and D21 are my choices. Uh, DV10 will work, but it'll take it a little drier than the other two will. Uh, I, I like this to finish somewhere in the 10, 20 range. Um, it, it helps to balance the uh, acidity and tartness real well in this without being overly sweet. Um, but it, it just gives you a... Uh, the, the blueberries just sort of make up for what the apples that we have available to us in the U.S. Uh, are lacking. And uh, by letting it sit on the berries, it, it, you'll get even some of the bitterness from the, from the seeds and the skins, uh, which is making up for the lack of bitter apples that we have. And uh, it's not overly blueberry, really. Uh, it's, but it is definitely a, a blueberry fa- flavor there. It's going to take a little more aging than what we normally talk about on this show, but, uh, nothing excessive. And, uh, I think everybody should give it a try. And, it, you know, it's not really, uh, a difficult process. It's, it's just something that you have to sort of keep an eye on. Yeah. Um, the, well, the, the changes, if you want to write these down, JD, uh, yeah. The changes I, I, uh, in the email, I said two and a half pounds of blueberries. That should be 2.75 uh, pounds of blueberries. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think I forgot to mention um, that to put the pectic enzyme in, but it was listed. So yeah, uh, listed. I don't think I put it in the. Yeah, but I didn't put. I didn't say it goes right in primary. And. Um, and then uh, the other thing that I left out on the email was uh, after you get this off the lees aging into tertiary, uh, it would be a good idea maybe to put some uh, brandy-soaked oak cubes on it for a couple of months. Wow! And uh, if you're buying if you're buying the cubes, I would probably use for a one gallon. I'd probably wouldn't use but about three or four of the uh, medium toast American oak. Uh, you can soak those for a few days in some brandy if you want. Three or, three or four. You're not talking three or four ounces. That's enough for five gallons. You're talking no, just three or four cubes. Three or four cubes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. About, you know, no, probably no more than about four cubes for, for a gallon Yeah. since it's such a small amount. And uh, you can soak those in a little bit of brandy for a few days beforehand. And uh, let it sit on there a couple of months. Yeah, um, make a make a really good sizer. Sounds a, like it. I, I think it'd be a good uh, attempt for anyone who's been listening. Should be pretty familiar with all the other details. I didn't give uh, specific amounts on the nutrients because I did that email in a hurry. But uh, you you can use the Tosna uh, calculator and figure all that out. Yeah. So basically, the ingredients are one can of frozen apple juice concentrate, a gallon of apple juice, uh, 2.75 or two and three quarter pounds frozen blueberries. Uh, I suppose the same in fresh if you can get them. Uh, yeah. Honey, honey, the amount to be determined. Now you, you we're looking for the honey to take you to 1.130. If I read this right. 
Um, yeah, it's going to be a, a balancing act. You're going to start out yeah. with about three quarts of the juice and your concentrate and put in some honey. And you just want to get it to the point where you're at about a starting gravity of 1130. And, uh, uh, you know, you want to be somewhere around a gallon and a half total volume. So to, to account for racking losses. So, um, you, you just sort of have to balance it back and forth, add a little honey, add a little juice until you get to that gravity at that volume. Would you, uh, uh, you know, another thing too, with, with the lalazime, uh, and or pectic enzyme, uh, addition and the Camden tablet, uh, I would probably let that sit on those two for what, a couple of days? Before I well, uh, in in this case, you you really don't have to because we're going to let it sit in primary for about six weeks. Okay. So uh, there's really no need to do it beforehand. All right. It's all everything's going to stay in the primary bucket undisturbed after primary is over for about six weeks. Yeah. So it's okay. going to have plenty of time to do its thing. Excellent. Uh, man, that sounds really good. Uh, and it just so happens that I've got two one gallon containers of apple juice and an empty two gallon food container here. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I just don't have yeah. any blueberries. Um, yeah. And the, the apple juice concentrate, that's just to boost the, uh, the apple flavor in it more sure. than anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, this sounds uh, this sounds really good, Chris, and I'll make the changes on the recipe. Uh I tell you what, what I'll do is I'll make the changes on the recipe, shoot you an email. Uh you can verify it and then we'll put it up on the website. Uh you know, if anybody okay. wants to give this a shot, but uh, man, it really sounds yeah, good. Yeah, we need to we need to give credit to to Pete Bakalich for the sure. original recipe because it did uh the the inspiration came from him on this. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. No problem. Um, Jeff, you had, uh, it was either Jeff or Ryan. I think the email came from, from Jeff, as I remember. Uh, Scott Monroe, he's an avid listener uh, to the show. Uh, and, uh, man, the guy really pays attention, too, because I'll get, I'll get uh, notices on Facebook uh, that, you know, uh, he's doing something or tried something that, uh, you know, we had mentioned on the show. So uh, he's probably one of our biggest fans out there. But you fielded a question from him uh, about, well, I, I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Well, sure. We were talking about his uh, the, the kit that he put together for his bracket uh, this morning. And uh, I, I thought it would be a, an interesting question to post to the group and kind of just get everybody's thoughts on. Um, because, you know, part of the beer brewing process is doing a boil to, uh, to get the sugars dissolved and get, uh, the, the alpha acids out of your hops, this, that, and the other. And, uh, he was a little bit worried that his, uh, his, his boiling was a little bit more aggressive than it should have been because he ended up with slightly less than a gallon in his, his, uh, his batch mm -hmm. size there. He ended up yeah. with, I, I want to say it was three quarters of a gallon and change. Um, and, you know, he, he asked me if, if he should worry about that, if he should, um, you know, add some, some more water to the fermenter. Um, and well, I, I assume he was working with a kit and that the kit kind of had a, a pre-measured amount of, uh, significant gravity or pre-measured amount of ingredients that it was going for. So adding water to that was probably a good idea. Um, and he asked if he should boil it first. And it occurred to me that, yeah, well, there, there may be, you know, uh, parasites or things in there that could potentially take over the, the chances are slim, but um, it, it wouldn't hurt to be to be um, prudent about that. And it, the, the the simpler solution, though, rather than boiling it and risking stripping oxygen out of the water, would be to basically like pasteurize it, hold it above 150 degrees Fahrenheit for something like 20 or 30 minutes, uh, so that you kill anything that's going to try and outcompete that yeast. Uh, before you add it in there, and of course, before you add it in there, you also have to to take it to below ten to, sorry, within ten degrees of the uh, the temperature of the muster forbidding you're fermenting at um, to uh, to make sure you're not shocking the yeast either. Yeah, 
Um, so I, I, I kind of thought I'd throw that, throw that out there and see if, uh, see what you guys thought about that. If that's, uh, you know, too much effort, just throw some water in, call it good. Or, um, you know, if you would just forego it and make a little bit stronger drink. Um, so what do you guys think? I think, uh, I I mean, if he's working with a beer kit, I mean, uh, you know, like when I do mine, I put two and a half gallons and that's my starting amount. But what I wind up with is far less than that maybe two gallons. And, uh, but of course when it goes into the fermenter, I'm topping up with water to the five gallon mark. Uh, so, and it's just, I'm, you know, just using regular spring water. Uh, Ryan, uh, what do you, uh, uh, how, yeah. how would you treat? When I add the additional water, um, I'm using stuff out of my Brita water pitcher. Uh, I, you know, I'm not overly concerned about um, going into primary. I mean, if there's nutrients in there or even if there's any kind of microorganisms, I mean, let's go back to thousands of years ago of why, you know, why the Last Supper was bread and wine. And it's it's because the water wasn't safe to drink, but once right. they started fermenting things, it becomes safe to drink. So, I, you know, I feel like as long as you've got a a, a decent water, um, you're going to be just fine, you know, and going into your primary fermentation. Yeah. Aaron, well, and that's another good point, uh, if I can interject there. Uh, the Brita filter also does one nice thing if you're using tap water. Uh, because if there's chloramines or chlorine in your your water uh, and the yeast get to act on that, you can end up with some nasty, like the uh, the, the plasticky or the used Band-Aid kind of taste uh, from the way those interact oh. together. Oh, yeah. that's sick. Uh, wow. Okay. Aaron, have you got uh, anything to add at all? Or Not really. I, I think... JD, the method that you described that you use in terms of topping up just with spring water up to the five gallon mark, that's that's pretty much what I do as well. Yeah. Um I don't have a vessel. In fact, at my your your kitchen stove, you're gonna have a hell of a time trying to boil five gallons of liquid on your kitchen stove anyway, because there's just not enough BTUs there to uh, you know, you might get a bubble or two off the bottom, but you're not going to get a standing rolling boil like what's required. So, um, and I don't know. I mean, I don't see. I'm assuming this is a one gallon kit. Do you think, Jeff, or or uh, that was the impression that I got from him? But let me yeah. you know, check that out. Yeah, I, yeah. I want to say it was a, a one gallon. Uh, he's saying you lost about uh, 0.3 to 0.4 gallons during the boil. Uh, so he, uh, he started with more than a gallon, about a gallon and a quarter, um, and just lost a little bit more than he was expecting to. Yeah. Scott, if you're listening, uh, but, uh, PM me real quick on Facebook. Uh, I've got it open and just, uh, with a number, tell me one, five, uh, as to the size of your, uh, your project there, but I, I got to. I, I'm actually I think on with I, Scott now. He's saying one did, gallon. One gallon. Okay, <laughs> good. Perfect. Okay. All right. So yeah. So I, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm with Ryan. I, I really don't see the point in boiling the water. Um, if you've got good clean water where you live, if that's what you typically use in your in your mead making and uh, beer making, then you know, just go ahead and add that to your fermenter. You'll be fine. Uh, if yeah, you're I've unsure, had, I've had people. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to say, I mean, if if you're unsure, like where I live, I mean, they put so much crap in the water out here. Uh, I use store-bought spring water. So, but to go ahead, Chris. No, I, I use store-bought spring water for everything that I make. And, and I've actually, I think I've said this before, I've heard people who avoided uh, sanitizers that you have to rinse because they said, well, if you rinse them, then you're putting water, you know, it's right. going to ruin your sanitization. But uh, the water that you're using is good enough to put in your meat or beer uh, without boiling it. So if it's good enough to make the mead with, it should be okay to rinse your fermenter with. 
uh, I just I don't see a problem there. So right. Mm-hmm. Well, and the other I would thing just, that I had. Sorry to cut you off. No, that's fine. Well, uh, the other thing that I had I'd thought about, you know, when, after the fact here was, well, the whole point of the no boil method with mead is that honey is naturally um, naturally antimicrobial, uh, and granted, he's got other things besides honey into the, this uh, this must. Now, there's it's a it's a braggot, so. Um, but we're also bumping that significant gravity up pretty high to where it may not even be hospitable to it. Or you know, the, if it's a braggot and you know, we're doing this right, the majority of the, the fermentable sugars are coming from honey anyway. Does that make it even less you know, necessary to, to treat that water or to heat that water up and kill things um, beforehand? Yeah. Yeah, but no yeah. matter how much sanitization you do or how much boiling uh once you cool that water down to room temperature or brewing temperature uh there's so many microbes in the air that you've just introduced billions more into oh, yeah. it before you ever start fermenting we live in a world dominated by microbes they're yep. everywhere we're never going to get rid of them and so i think people really get overly obsessed with with this issue of sanitization and things when it's really it's futile because you can't get away from it uh lucky for us there's just not enough of the bad things floating around that it occurs frequently but you know it can occur sure but um i I just wouldn't stress over it that much yeah, and if you don't, you know, if you doubt, uh, if you doubt what Chris is talking about the microbes, uh, just check with your wife when she dusts all the, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, goes through the house and does all the dusting and vacuuming. Uh, I do that at my house uh, on a weekly basis uh, because we have to. We, I live, I mean, get this, I live about a quarter of a mile from the 405 freeway. And we get so much dust, it's not even funny. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, you know, that's why, I can't, that's why I'm such a, you know, I've, I'm not so much now. But when I first started this thing, and Chris kind of tested this one of the first shows that I did over at God Mead. I mean, my kitchen looked like a damn operating room. Uh, I mean, I, I sanitized everything, the countertops, the floor, the walls, I mean, everything. I was just so scared that something was going to get into my mead and, you know, make people sick, my relatives and whatnot. But, you know, come to find out that I didn't need to be that anal about it. But, uh, um, I, you know, I just I was just a clean freak about this uh, because I knew other people besides me were going to drink it. So, um, but uh, anyway, well, guys, uh, that pretty much wraps the show for tonight. I got, if, oh, if I can... Uh-oh. I see Ryan's hand going up. Uh, 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 <laughs> if, if I can... If I yeah, can jump in, I've yeah. got I've got to give one quick shout out, and then I got one question. I'll make it real quick for the group. Uh, my brother, who lives in Omaha, Jesse, got me a nice jar of watermelon blossom honey. Oh wow! Uh, he knows that I, you know, he he's help me make mead he's he likes drinking it that kind of thing quick question for the group it's a small jar it's a one and a half pound jar um i'm going to use it in a one gallon batch which should be just fine for my session strength stuff uh quick poll should i make a traditional out of it or should i juice a watermelon and no. go watermelon water on top of watermelon honey. No. no. What do you guys no. think? No. Traditional. No. Traditional. Traditional. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, I want to know what that stuff tastes like. <laughs> yep. Pretty much. Yeah, because I've never even heard of it. Yep. <laughs> Unanimous. Well, that was a quick poll. <laughs> <laughs> Traditional yeah. it is. I'm gonna do a. I'll use a nice clean yeast, and we'll have. My guess is that's gonna settle in at about seven and a half percent ABV, and and which will be great session strength, and and let it. Uh, I'll let it sit for a little while to bring back some of that honey flavor, and and we'll go with it. 
Yeah, I, I mm -hmm. definitely would be curious as to uh, take accurate, detailed notes because I want to know what that stuff tasted like uh, in the end. So, uh, you know, whether you actually get any watermelon. Hey, I mean, I'm looking for that kind of stuff out of all these whacked out honeys that I get here, too. I mean, uh, you know, the blackberry, for crying out loud, I put blackberry honey in the a hibiscus uh, project that I did using Jeff's recipe. Now, I can't tell you. Uh, in fact, uh, it's about ready to bottle, Jeff. And uh, as soon as I get into the bottle, uh, I'll send you one. But I have no clue as to what this might have contributed to the hibiscus. It damn sure didn't taste like blackberries to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll leave it at that. But... Uh, <laughs> I'd be yeah, and Ryan, if I had if I had one and a half pounds of that honey, I think uh, I would forego the session strength, and I would probably just make whatever it will make in a full strength mead, just so that I can get the full flavor of it and see what it's like. Yeah. I mean, even if you only come out with you know a quart of mead, well, just that's what I would do. Yeah, it's probably enough to do a uh, maybe a start with a half gallon, uh, you know, in primary, and then go down from there. Yeah, yeah, I, I would probably just get whatever I could get out of it at full strength, just so that I could evaluate it. That sounds like a plan. Well, thanks yeah. for the <laughs> input, guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, that's going to uh, wrap the show here tonight. I don't even know how far we are into this thing. I don't even know what week we're on, but uh, typically we do six and two. Uh, I'll have to check the calendar and see where we're at. I know we're coming into the holidays here pretty soon, but uh, always a blast here with uh, the crew. Uh, you can look for us again on themeathouse.com. Uh, the replays are always available there. Uh, they're on iTunes. They're on Stitcher. Uh, gosh, we just get them spread out all over the place. We're over 4,000 downloads, guys. Uh, so we've got uh, quite a few people listening. Uh, after the fact, uh, but I know Scott Monroe, I know you're always out there live. So with that, hey, what do you say we all get together next Tuesday night? Do it again. We'll see you.